One of the problems that, that, that I believe in terms of uh, uh, training of doctors is that doctors quite rightly uh, are focused upon uh, the needs of the patient in front of them. But they also have to take account of the needs of all of their patients um, within their practice, within that environment of the ward or the department or the hospital as a whole. So I think leadership that's exercised at operational level in uh, direct relationship with a patient is different to the leadership that is needed in, for example, um, in, a, in a department uh, uh, or, or in a directorate uh, or across a hospital as a whole. And this is often a dilemma for doctors because clearly and quite rightly they're trained to focus on the needs of individuals. As a patient, that's exactly what I want my doctor to do. But in taking into account the responsibilities of all the patients, the population of patients that come into contact with that department, they need to have a different mindset. So they have to think not so much about the individual, but about the population and all the individuals uh, that come into contact with that department. There are, in my opinion, clear differences between um, the value that's placed on clinical leadership in different countries. So, for example, I would suggest that uh, the one country where greatest value is placed on clinical leadership is probably, uh, probably the USA, uh, in States, um, where um, there are many organizations, leading organizations like the, the Cleveland Clinic, for example, where um, the top of the pyramid in terms of career progression is seen uh, not just as great uh, um, uh, clinical skills, but also taking on clinical leadership responsibilities. So there's an expectation that the senior leaders in the organisation come from the clinical body. At the other extreme, I would say Australasia, particularly Australia, there's very little value put on clinical leadership. In fact, um, I was out there recently talking to a number of clinicians who uh, didn't really understand the importance of their engagement at all. Um, it was almost uh, as if I were stepping back 10 years where the NHS um, uh, was at that time. I think Europe is somewhere in the middle, and I think Europe is, has a much more diverse set of cultures. Um, I think some countries' clinical leadership is much more valued. Um, I think uh, the Netherlands, for example, clinical leadership is seen as being uh, an important uh, 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 skill and uh, important to be involved. I think the NHS is uh, probably midway in the pack in Europe. Um, but I think across the world, I think there is uh, um, increasing pressure for clinicians to take greater responsibility for leadership. I do believe a large part of it, though, is the skill, the ability of those doctors who choose to take on leadership roles who become the clinical directors and the medical directors in their organisations. And going back to the 1980s, there was an assumption that if you identify people who wanted to do that, they could become great leaders without much in the way of support or development or indeed training to do the job. We know that isn't the case now and there's been, uh, thankfully, a big increase in the investment in medical leadership development to support those doctors who want to go in that direction to do so uh, effectively. But if you look across the NHS, it wouldn't be true to say today that every clinical director has benefited from those kinds of development programmes and there's a, a broad sp spread of uh, competence and skill among those who choose to do those jobs. My view is that our most successful, our most experienced leaders absolutely get medical leadership. They know they cannot succeed in the roles they've been appointed to unless they make a personal commitment to developing the medics in their organisations, supporting them to take on leadership roles and having lots of medical leaders at the microsystem level who are taking a visible role in improving quality, improving services and, as a consequence of that, keeping control over finances. But sometimes, in my view, our chief executives only get to that point, having gone down other routes first and not having seen it as the highest priority in their first chief executive appointment. While we have made progress in getting more doctors to take on leadership roles in NHS hospitals, in community services and increasingly now in primary care, progress has been painfully slow. That we haven't progressed at the pace that I would have wished and that Roy Griffiths had in his mind when he wrote his report back in 1983.